Darn it, I got too greedy. That last two million probably tipped them off. I should have quit while I was ahead. I sensed something was off with that deal. Now they're closing in, but they don't realize I'm onto them. That works to my advantage. I still have time to disappear and make sure they can't trace me any further. Good thing I planned for this. But who am I? And who's after me? My current identity doesn't matter, it's about to vanish. In two hours, you'll change everything. The trail they're following will lead to a dead end before they gather enough information to expose me. What I am, or will be soon, is a hacker a top tier one. And I'm angry, with a short list of targets. I'm going after drug syndicates, tracking their finances, and anonymously tipping off the authorities with hard evidence. I've exposed four politicians, at least 50 cops, a dozen soldiers across borders, and countless other traitors. I've siphoned over 100 million from their accounts, keeping a cut for myself but donating about 80 to various charities, mainly helping addicts and funding rehab programs. Why, you ask? It all started with my little sister getting involved with the wrong crowd. I warned her, but she didn't listen. I tried to protect her after our parents died, but she made her choices. I've always been good with computers. However, the two dark years I spent in isolation after identifying what was left of her body transformed me from skilled to nearly supernatural. Hiding in the basement of our old family home, I uncovered dark secrets and mastered manipulating them. I found back doors in most security systems. During those years, incriminating intel about a gang of lowlifes who tortured and killed my sister reached the DEA. Rival gangs learned that this gang had state evidence and were using it to cut deals, prompting them to act quicker than the authorities. The government saved a fortune on legal battles. Now those chasing me are on the cartel's payroll, the same cartel I relieved of about 30 million. I should have stopped at 28 million, but I discovered another account. I sensed something off about it, but I was young, foolish, and enraged. Once that money passed through 40 accounts in six countries, my anti-hacking alarms went off. They planted a trace program on the account they targeted where the breach originated. It'll take them some time they need to sift through about 100 IP addresses before even reaching a chain of bypass servers. I plugged in the flash drive and executed a few commands. The trail leading to me was effectively cut off, leaving them no access to data. The abandoned building I called home went up in flames due to a fire started by some homeless people. The hard drives, memory cards, and all my personal documents were destroyed in the blaze. Confident that no information could be salvaged, I hopped in my van and headed west, reaching Los Angeles four days later. Sweetheart, I need your help. The computer's acting up again. I pleaded with my lovely wife, Linda. Honestly, Mark, how can a 25-year-old be so clueless with computers? She teased, planting a quick kiss on my forehead. A few clicks and keystrokes later, I was back to checking emails. Dinner's in half an hour. Thanks, dear, I replied, watching her head to the kitchen. It's been years since Linda and I got married, and I still can't believe my luck. After leaving my old life behind, I reinvented myself, working as a trucker at a local lumber yard with decent wages, thanks to our union. I carefully withdrew a couple hundred grand from one of my offshore accounts and bought a cozy three-bedroom house on an acre of land. I built a discreet structure next to the house for storage and set up a hidden room to revamp my computer system. It looked like a regular concrete floor, but underneath, it housed stairs leading underground. I decided to lay low on chasing down the cartels for a while. I had enough cash stashed away for emergencies and it seemed wise to disappear and let things cool down. However, I didn't want to lose my skills, and I needed to stay updated with new tech. The shop was for my hobby of restoring classic muscle cars. Since my wife had no interest in that, she never set foot in my workshop. It also provided me with the solitude to go online and dabble a bit without her knowing. You might wonder why I keep this side of me hidden from her. Well, she knows me as a simple mechanic and truck driver with little computer knowledge. Obviously, when we first met and started dating, I couldn't just reveal that I was a hacker known as Ghost in the Cyber Underground. First, the feds were after me for several cyber crimes, eager to recruit me for their own purposes. 
Second, some dangerous criminal outfits were on the hunt for me. If they figured out my location, things would have turned ugly real quick. How would our relationship survive that? After we got married, I had to take even more precautions for her safety. If she stayed clueless, they couldn't use her to get to me. It was best that she only knew the man she married. Let me tell you about my wife. To me, she's the most gorgeous woman in the world. Sure, to others she might seem average, but to me, she's perfect. She stands at 56 with wavy copper-brown hair that flows to her mid-back. Her emerald green eyes captivate me every time I look into them. She's got a small waist, a flat tummy, wider hips, and an incredibly attractive backside. Her legs are long, slender, toned, and sun-kissed. She's got a cute nose, high cheekbones, dimples when she smiles, full lips, and a modest chin. So how did we meet? I was working at the sawmill one afternoon when she walked in looking for some boards for shelves in her new apartment. As we picked out her order, she mentioned she wasn't good with tools. Seeing an opportunity, I offered to come by after work to set up the shelves for her. My only request was that she buy the beer and dinner the next evening. That dinner turned into dancing. Our first date ended with a simple kiss on the cheek. I was pretty nervous around women. Let me explain. When I stole all that money from the cartel, I was a skinny 19-year-old computer nerd. My romantic experience was non-existent. After moving to Los Angeles, I had three encounters with escorts. The first one was robotic and unengaging. The second, at a brothel in Parump, at least pretended to care. The third was more educational. I paid for the whole night and learned how to satisfy a woman. Now, I was with a woman I genuinely cared about. We didn't make love until our fifth date. I took her to a fancy restaurant and then to a lively dance club. After a bottle of wine and some drinks, we danced for two hours before heading back to my place. Seeing her without clothes for the first time, she was a goddess. Her damp sheets confirmed she was as happy as I was. The lessons from the escort had paid off. I had spent a year getting fit and now I was 61 with muscle mass and endurance. Despite being a nerd, I had never thought about my size until the escorts commented on it. I didn't believe them thinking they had to say that. Linda and I dated for six months before I proposed, and six months later, we got married. We were happy. Linda worked as an accountant for a big company in Los Angeles, making a good salary. Combined with my earnings, we lived comfortably. I didn't need to touch my hidden funds. We enjoyed top-notch restaurants, shows, and took rides on a pontoon boat on the lake. Both of us drove nice cars, and our love life was active and adventurous. Without kids, we explored every corner of our house, backyard, pool, and hot tub. Typically, after getting home from work, I'd spend a few hours in my workshop before dinner. Sometimes I'd be working on one of my projects, other times I'd be in my secret room on the computer. I wasn't doing anything illegal, just exploring systems I shouldn't have been. I never stole data or tampered with systems, I was just sharpening my skills. I could have taken lots of money and data, but I didn't want to leave any traces. After dinner, we'd snuggle on the couch and watch a movie before bed. Often our night ended with a few hours of passionate lovemaking before falling asleep. I continued to act clueless about technology. After all, who would suspect that someone who can't check their email is one of the world's most notorious hackers? During this time, I hacked into banks, government agencies, and large corporations. I also reconfigured my network of bots. I masked my location by launching hacks from multiple foreign servers. About six months ago, I noticed Linda becoming more stressed. At first, it didn't seem like a big deal, though our intimacy dropped from four times a week to two. She started working longer hours and seemed exhausted when she got home. Most nights, she'd head straight to the shower, eat dinner, and then go to bed. When I asked, she mentioned a big account her company was trying to settle. It sounded plausible. Occasionally, she'd call on a Friday to say she'd be at happy hour with co-workers. She'd done this enough times that I didn't worry. After about six months, I asked how long this would continue, figuring the account would be settled or forgotten by then. Linda said it would likely be another week or two. Feeling she deserved some pampering, 
I surprised her with a full-day spa package for that Saturday. She was thrilled when I gave it to her on Wednesday night. After thanking me, we ended up in bed enjoying each other. Saturday came and she left for her spa day at 900 a.m. with a quick kiss goodbye, returning around 400 in the afternoon. I grabbed my coffee and headed to the shop to finish an engine on the bench. After about an hour, I took a break and went to my computer room. Until then, I had avoided hacking into Linda's company systems. It was a principle of mine, never foul your own nest. I was firm on this. I never meddled with the company I worked for, nor would I with hers. After logging in and checking my security programs, I started to wonder about this big account Linda's company was dealing with. Maybe it was worth investigating, even accessing their servers to see what they held. Their security was laughably easy to bypass I was in within minutes. My first stop was Linda's computer since she was working on the project. I figured I could get some insights from there. Oddly, there was nothing noteworthy about the new major clients. I ran a few searches using keywords like offer, new client, quote, and related terms, but found nothing. I then delved into her folders. That's when I found a locked folder labeled Photos for James. Why did Linda have a folder of photos for that guy? Yes, I knew who James was. I'd met him several times at corporate events I attended with Linda. Despite her belief that he was good with computers, I didn't like him. It took seconds to unlock the folder. To say I was shocked is an understatement. Inside were dozens of explicit photos of Linda in her office, some depicting her with another man in various positions. What hit me hardest were the photos of acts she had refused me. I sat there stunned. In that moment, a part of me died. Eventually, I snapped out of it and began thinking about confronting her when she got home. Divorcing her was inevitable. I had a few hours before her return, so I continued searching for more clues. I suspected this started about six months ago when I first noticed her change in behavior. Upon digging into her emails, I was met with an even bigger shock. Several email exchanges revealed her affair with this person was much longer than I thought. They had been involved for about a year before she met me. If that's the case, why start a relationship with me? What's really going on? Another email mentioned accounting discrepancies with major clients and their own company, along with something about an offshore account. I switched to James's computer. There, too, were photos of Linda, some in a motel room and others in another man's bedroom. Realizing I needed more time, I copied both his and Linda's computers, as well as their folders on the company network, onto a spare drive on my server. Out of habit, I checked the personnel folder on the server and paused when I saw my name on a folder. Before disconnecting, I installed spyware on both computers and the server, ensuring all their activities would be redirected to my system. Needless to say, my car projects took a back seat for a while. When Linda came back from her spa day, she showed her gratitude with a night of intense passion. Yes, I was repulsed by her betrayal, but I couldn't resist the physical connection with someone so stunning and lively. Even if she was a snake, the temptation was too strong. On Sunday morning, I went back to my workshop. While Linda slept in, I grabbed her phone and installed spyware. This allowed me to copy her text messages to my computer and record all phone calls, which were saved on a separate hard drive. I could also monitor her online activities. Linda left around 1,000 a.m. claiming she was meeting a friend for shopping. Since she had disabled the location tracking on her phone, I hacked into her car's GPS to follow her movements. Surprisingly, she did go to the mall. Once I was sure she wouldn't be back soon, I seized her laptop. First, I duplicated all its contents onto another hard drive. Then I installed a keylogger and configured the camera for remote access. Knowing I had limited time, I quickly scanned her browser history. That's when I discovered a second email address and noticed frequent visits to a bank in the Cayman Islands. I needed to investigate further. When I heard Linda return home, I wiped grease and oil from my hands and face to make it look like I'd been working on the car. Then it was our usual routine shower, dinner, a movie, and off to bed. For the next week, I maintained the act of a clueless, loving husband. Every evening, I'd head to the shop, pretending to work on my cars. In reality, I was sifting through the mountains of data I had collected. One Tuesday night, I found an exchange between Linda and James that caught my attention. 
James reminded her to delete the browsing history on my laptop after using it. Why was she using my laptop? Sure, I had set it up to connect to servers immediately after buying it, but I never thought to check it myself. The next evening, while reviewing updates from their work computers, I noticed a new data stream. Instantly recognizing it as coming from my personal laptop, I prioritized it. As I examined this new stream, I saw money transfers taking place. I activated the laptop camera and redirected the feed to another screen. Linda was using my computer, Bluetooth earpiece in place. The microphone picked up her voice during a call. Using a third screen, I initiated a live feed of her conversation. I watched and listened as Linda, with James's guidance, transferred around 50000 from a fabricated account at their company to a bank in the Cayman Islands, all done through my computer. After finishing, she wiped the day's history and logged out. What's really going on here? I hadn't had a chance to check my personnel file in their HR folder. To complicate things, I found out I had been appointed as a computer security consultant without my knowledge. James, as the head of their IT department, apparently made the hiring decisions. I also found several payments for my services, all funneled into the Cayman Islands account. It was clear I was being set up in a scheme where Linda and James used my computer and IP address to transfer large sums of money from a fake account at their company to an offshore bank. I also learned of Linda and James's affair dating back to before I even met Linda. I realized I was being drawn into a dangerous trap. It was time to change my approach. Now fully aware of the situation, I needed to gauge the extent of the problem and devise a plan. Upon scrutinizing the Cayman Islands account, I found nearly 10 million hidden away. The transactions began about six months after Linda and I got married. They had also tried to obscure the computer used for the money transfers, adding to the complexity. A deeper dive into my personnel file revealed several alarming red flags. When everything inevitably went south, I would be the prime suspect. So what was my next move? Surprisingly, it wasn't hard to act normal around Linda. Did she want physical intimacy? I indulged her. Despite everything, I found myself enjoying our time together. She was attractive and I took every chance to be close to her. The following Saturday, I combed through her emails from the start of our relationship. That's when I discovered they had planned to use me as their scapegoat from the very beginning. While Linda found me appealing, Linda believed that being in a physical relationship with me wouldn't cause any problems. She had some concerns about my supposed lack of computer skills, but James saw it as an advantage. The less I knew, the safer their scheme was. But it was time for my counterattack. I began by setting up a few new bank accounts. Then I activated my bot network. Most of these bots were designed to distract, but a small group could be traced back, requiring an expert to follow the trail. I didn't want it to be too simple. Naturally, I erased the personnel file with my name from Linda's company servers. Additionally, I altered all file transfers on my laptop to display a different IP address to prevent any recurrence. I unleashed a powerful virus on my laptop and disconnected it from my secret servers. Later that evening, when I checked my email, I discovered that the virus had ravaged my laptop, rendering it nearly useless. I wasn't surprised to see the frustration on Linda's face when she saw the damage. The next morning, I found a conversation between Linda and James. They were close to completing their scheme. They needed just two more transfers to secure another 10 million before framing me. The plan was for Linda to discover the theft and lead the investigation. Meanwhile, James, as the IT manager, would handle the cyber aspect. All evidence pointed directly at me. Linda would file for divorce while I languished in jail, and in about a year she'd marry James. Sure, there might be some suspicion about Linda's involvement, but she would deflect it by citing her investigation and claiming I had hidden my computer skills from her. It would look like she was a victim, exploited by me to access the company's systems. They laughed at the thought of me answering questions about the missing money, clueless about what the police were talking about. 
Linda offered to buy me a replacement laptop, suggesting they could finalize the last transfers within the next three weeks. Now I had a clear deadline. On Monday, I told my boss that I needed a week off for personal matters, which wasn't an issue given my surplus of leave. I scoured the internet to find the toughest, most ruthless divorce attorney in town and booked an appointment for the next day. While they thought they had a three-week window, they'd be lucky to get two. Back home, I powered up my computer and got to work. I accessed James' home computer. For an IT expert, you'd think he'd know to shut it down when not in use, but no such luck. He merely turned off the monitor. I routed his computer through a server in Belarus, ensuring it would be a dead end for anyone trying to trace it. My time with the cartel five years ago had taught me a lot about security. Despite changing their accounts and passwords, they still used the same banks. Updated passwords are only effective if you don't store them on personal computers, which are vulnerable to phishing attacks embedded in email links promising desirable products. This was just the first phase. I did deal with James after I took care of Linda. I still needed him to bring her down so he couldn't be eliminated just yet. As per my routine, I headed to my shop to tinker with my car. Meanwhile, Linda went to Walmart to buy a new laptop for me. During her absence, I laid the groundwork for my plan. It was crucial for her to be home when using the computer. If she could prove she wasn't home, she'd have an alibi. I couldn't allow that. Upon her return, she messaged me that she'd bought the laptop and estimated it would take about an hour to set up. I expressed my gratitude and got to work. First, I severed all connections with James. Despite my disdain for her, I didn't want her to suffer too much. James would likely face a much harsher fate, while Linda might only end up in prison for decades. I established a separate server route to Linda's laptop, providing a direct link to her work computer and then to the company servers. I funneled $20 million from the company into four accounts under her name. I finalized travel arrangements, securing a one-way ticket for her to the Cayman Islands on Thursday morning. Before she left her computer, I purged James from her contacts, deleted all emails with him, and wiped the account history clean. Then I removed all my spyware, taking a calculated risk that she wouldn't have enough time to react. Next, I terminated and erased the connection with her laptop. After completing these tasks, I remotely disabled the wireless router in the house. I had a separate, superior router in the store, unbeknownst to her. A message surfaced from the spyware on her phone indicating she had finished setting up the laptop for me when the internet suddenly vanished, just as she was about to execute another transfer on my computer. I couldn't help but laugh as they struggled with the issue. While they were distracted, I swiftly transferred all the stolen money into new accounts under Linda's name. Once the account was emptied, I promptly closed it. Lastly, I removed the spyware from Linda's phone to prevent any unwanted attention. Satisfied with my actions, I headed out for dinner. Tomorrow promised to be an eventful day, to say the least. Linda appeared visibly anxious when I returned home. Linda informed me that my new computer was set up, but the internet was down, preventing me from logging in or checking my email. Little did she know, this was hardly an issue for me. Throughout the evening, she was glued to her phone, her attention never straying from it during the entire movie. I could sense her growing frustration, realizing her attempts to access the account had likely failed. She seemed to be sending frantic messages. As I headed to bed, a smirk formed on my face. There would be no intimacy that night. The next morning, I left the house before Linda went to work, killing time until my appointment with the lawyer. I couldn't help but wonder how Linda's day would unfold. Soon enough, I'd have all the answers. Finally, I was welcomed into my lawyer's office, you know those TV dramas where a sharp lawyer, impeccably dressed, strides into the courtroom and effortlessly outmaneuvers the opposition? That was my lawyer. Standing at 56, with a radiant face, curves that could make a race car swerve, legs that seemed to stretch on forever, and a commanding presence. Within minutes, it was clear she was going to be a formidable force in the courtroom. After ensuring confidentiality, I poured out the details of my wife's infidelity and the embezzlement scheme. When she asked how I knew all this, I spun a tale. 
I claimed I was using my wife's laptop because mine was broken, and that's when I stumbled upon a folder filled with explicit photos and discovered incriminating emails to her lover. Those emails laid bare her betrayal in their illicit dealings. I just wanted out of this marriage before everything exploded. She agreed to take on the case and began preparing the necessary documents. She mentioned she could serve Linda by the end of the week. However, I urged her to wait a bit longer. I had a sudden flash of inspiration and didn't want to reveal my hand too soon. With that, we concluded the meeting and I returned home, fired up my system, reactivated my home Wi-Fi, and got to work. I kept the spyware active on Linda's work computer. The next morning, chaos erupted at her office. The 20 million theft had been discovered, triggering an immediate investigation. Meanwhile, I hacked into James's phone. He traced the theft back to Linda and found their account drained, with the funds transferred to new ones totaling 20 million. Accusations flew, but no plausible explanations emerged. Suddenly, Linda received an email summoning her to a meeting with the CEO, CFO, and head of security. This was going to be interesting. The sound of several cars pulling into my driveway interrupted my thoughts. I secured the premises, heading to the main store and ensuring the secret door was locked. No need for anyone to snoop around in there. To maintain my cover, I smeared some grease on myself to look like I'd been working on my car. As I walked out of the store, I saw police cars and a large Chevrolet Suburban. The officers wore standard uniforms, but those emerging from the SUVs sported windbreakers with FBI emblazoned on them. Curious, I barely glanced at the warrants before ushering them into the house, offering full cooperation since I had nothing to hide. Playing the helpful homeowner, I pointed out my wife's computer and mentioned mine, which had barely been touched since we got it yesterday with the Wi-Fi down last night. Take whatever you need, I said. I'm not really savvy with computers. My story held up during several hours of intense questioning at the police station. After all, I was just a truck driver with minimal computer knowledge. I professed ignorance about my wife's work as an accountant, insisting I didn't know her clients. A one-way ticket out of the country? Only she would know about that. Poor James, forced to testify against her, must have felt deeply betrayed upon discovering she had siphoned off the money into her own accounts, leaving him with nothing. They soon realized I was clueless about the situation despite their thorough search of my workshop. They never discovered the hidden entrance to my computer room. Eventually, they sent me home, while Linda was arrested during my interrogation. James, witnessing the discovery of the money, must have been shattered to learn she had cut off his access, transferred the funds, and planned to leave him stranded. Anticipating the interrogation, I knew I would be implicated as her husband. Naturally, Linda reached out to me as her one phone call, so I quickly secured a lawyer for her. I meticulously researched local defense attorneys to ensure I didn't accidentally hire a competent one. Instead, I chose a mediocre lawyer, aiming for her conviction and a full sentence. The federal nature of the case intrigued me. There's no parole or early release. If sentenced to 20 years, it's 20 years served. I attended her bail hearing, using our house as collateral to secure her release due to flight risk. She wore an ankle monitor. Despite my disdain, I maintained the facade of a supportive husband. Thankfully, her distress spared me any marital duties, her seized phone was swiftly replaced by me, complete with spyware. Oddly, James blocked her when she reached out, refusing contact. Aware he'd testify against her, he cut ties. Stubbornly, she rejected a plea deal, adamant she was framed. She truly believed she'd win. Admittedly, she did take half the money, but not all, nor did she use that account, her computer, buy a ticket, or fire her partner. The money was returned without issue. The trial was a spectacle. Watching James testify against his lover, using computer records, revealed his inner conflict. He believed she planned to flee, abandoning him. Linda felt betrayed by her supposed soulmate, leading to her imprisonment. I felt triumphant during his three days of testimony, watching her transition from love to resentment. Despite her efforts on the stand, the overwhelming evidence left her unable to mount a credible defense. She now faces a 20-year sentence in federal prison.
With the trial over, it was time to deal with James. I had a devious plan for him, though he'd never know it was me behind his downfall. Such a scheme would be deeply satisfying. I instructed my lawyer to update the divorce papers to reflect Linda's conviction and lengthy incarceration. Within days, she was served. Setting up new accounts in Geneva and the Cayman Islands tied to James, I subtly left traces on the dark web pointing to his IP address. The ghost of my past exploits resurfaced after five years, sparking chatter among hackers. Now the challenge was to leave a trail convincing enough to implicate an experienced hacker, yet subtle enough to cast doubt on my involvement. I navigated through ten servers across six countries. Eventually, I deployed a legion of bots and initiated an assault on the first bank. After gaining access, I found the two target accounts and moved the funds to James' newly created accounts. Task completed, I halted the bank attack, severed my connection to James's computer, and monitored the dark web for any reactions. While I didn't expect immediate repercussions, caution was crucial. The following morning, another bank fell victim to an attack, resulting in the depletion of four additional accounts. Now, 20 million resided in the account I had set up for James, prompting a search for me. Though they wouldn't find me, the digital trail would eventually lead to the phantom. Various dark web hacker forums lit up with activity, indicating a group tracking the trail, likely the same one from five years ago. It was time to wrap this up. Returning to the bank, I bypassed James' computer and transferred the 20 million to another account in Switzerland, ensuring no trace of the transaction remained. I had no concerns about the cartel reclaiming that money. After reaccessing James' computer, I launched a targeted attack on a bank account containing a tracker. This time, the sum was small only 2 million, but it carried a crucial tracker. Last time, I fled because I was aware of the thefts and understood how the beacon operated. If I hadn't known about the money transfers or the accounts I had, and if I hadn't been aware of the tracker linked to that final account, I would have been caught. I wondered how James would try to explain all this. It would be fascinating to see him grilled about the money when he was clueless about what they were referring to. Now, it was time to sever all connections with his computer and eliminate any traces of my involvement. A week later, I cleared out my computer room, repurposing it as a storage area. While wrapping up paperwork for a property I had bought in Montana through an anonymous corporation, a news report aired about a missing person. James hadn't reported to work for several days, and his whereabouts were unknown. His vehicle was found abandoned in a shopping center parking lot, but he remained elusive. I wondered where he could have gone, but I had to get back to packing. No, I shouted as they used the cattle prod on me once more, trying to extract information. I swear I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Ghost, they retorted. This time you slipped up. The tracking software led us directly to your computer. We found all the data on it. We recovered two million from the recent hack, but we want to know where the remaining 20 million is, along with the 30 million from five years ago. Give us this information and we'll end your suffering swiftly. Keep lying, and it'll only get worse. However, I was truly clueless. They seized me as I was about to enter my car at the mall. I felt a sharp prick in my neck from a needle, then darkness enveloped me. Several hours later, I regained consciousness aboard a private jet, securely fastened to my seat. That's when the interrogation began. I had no clue what they were talking about. They kept referring to me as ghost, and asked about the money they claimed I had stolen. They said 20 million had vanished a few days ago, along with another 30 million five years back. My protestations of innocence fell on deaf ears. When they showed me the evidence from my personal computer, I was utterly shocked. They offered me two choices, give them the information they wanted for a swift death or endure unrelenting torment. Realizing I had no answers, I knew my fate was sealed. Now I found myself suspended and undressed from the ceiling of a bunker buried deep within the jungles of Colombia. For three agonizing days, I endured unspeakable torment. My legs were forcibly spread, granting them access to my genitals with cattle prods. On the first day, I was beaten for my silence. 
The next day brought the lash of a whip. Today, it was the agonizing jolt of cattle prods against my most sensitive areas. I wished I could give them the answers they wanted. I dreaded what the coming days might bring. James had disappeared over a month ago. His mutilated body was found on a Colombian roadside yesterday. Mark would vanish by day's end after one final stop. I was ready to embrace my new identity. I had already sent all my belongings to a Denver storage facility, funded anonymously through a bank transfer. Linda was brought in, shackled to the table across from me. She looked worse for wear orange wasn't her color. Without makeup, her hair unkempt and bags under her eyes, prison hadn't been kind to her. How are you holding up? I inquired. Please, Mark, you've got to help me. I'm innocent, she pleaded. I sighed. Linda, there's nothing I can do for you. Besides, we're getting divorced. Please, Mark, I didn't do it and I don't want a divorce. Just sign the papers, Linda, it's over. Please, Mark, talk to James. He can help me. We were friends once. Please reach out to him, she implored. Have you heard from James, I asked. No, I kept hoping he'd visit, but he never showed, she replied. Well, hell never come now. He was eliminated in Colombia. Her face drained of color. No, he couldn't have, she protested. Perhaps he didn't know, but they believed he did. Now, Linda, it's best you sign the divorce papers and move on. You're leaving me with nothing, she cried. You won't need anything here. You'll be here for the next 20 years. Please, Mark, you've got to help me. I can't stay here. I need to escape, Linda pleaded. It's time for me to share a story with you, Linda. Maybe this will shed some light, I replied. About five years ago, there was a skilled hacker known as Ghost. He earned this moniker for his expertise in covering his digital tracks. Like an elusive specter, he infiltrated computer systems and embarked on a mission to target cartels. Over 30 million was stolen from one cartel before they enlisted other hackers to hunt him down. Sensing the trackers closing in, Ghost vanished, leaving no trace behind and forging a new identity. He ceased all digital activity except for occasional minor hacks to stay sharp. To those around him, he appeared technologically inept, even to his wife. Yes, he fell in love and married. He cherished his wife deeply, but after three years of marriage, he stumbled upon a shocking truth. His wife was unfaithful, maintaining a relationship with her real boyfriend throughout their marriage. To make matters worse, he discovered that his wife had married him solely to implicate him in the embezzlement scheme she and her boyfriend were orchestrating. Her eyes widened and her complexion paled as I recounted their scheme. Determined not to let it unfold, Ghost devised a plan for retribution. He hacked into their devices and work network to gather evidence, shifting the blame away from himself and directly onto his wife. He also ensured her boyfriend believed she was cheating on him. The ultimate blow was orchestrating her lover's testimony against her, resulting in her lengthy imprisonment, shattering their hearts as they felt betrayed, much like Ghost had felt. You, she exhaled, processing the revelation. With his wife taken care of, it was time to pursue her lover. Since the cartel was still hunting Ghost, why not exact revenge and make them believe they had finally captured their target? Ghost used her lover's computer to steal a large sum from the cartel. Unfortunately, Ghost made a small error, leaving a trace back to the boyfriend. Consequently, the cartel traced the hack to him. Authorities suspect he endured torture for over a month before succumbing. Regrettably, he lacked the information the cartel sought. None of this is real or substantiated, but I thought this fictional account might help you cope. While I believe you are not entirely guilty as the evidence suggests, you're far from innocent. Just sign the papers. Imagine the repercussions if someone discovers evidence portraying you as an informant. Her face flushed with rage. You damn fool, she yelled, lunging towards me. The guards promptly restrained her, securing her to the table with short chains preventing her from reaching me. As they escorted her away, shrieking, I exited heading to a cheap disposable car parked at the mall. Leaving Mark behind, I walked to my real vehicle, ready to drive away with my new identity.